Hi, and welcome to Something by Brian. I'm Brian, and today's video is gonna be a draw and talk. So you're gonna see me draw a poster consisting of characters and motifs from various movies that actually released last year, and hear me talk about why those movie experiences were the best I had in 2020. So yeah, it's not a drawing tutorial. Actually, I'm pretty sure you should never do a drawing like this, finishing each segment separately. So don't learn anything from this time lapse, please. But yeah, as you probably all noticed, 2020 was pretty weird and full of disappointments. I watched about 120 movies last year and only 20-ish was actually 2020 releases. Oh, I'm from Denmark by the way, so if you're thinking that's not a 2020 release, then yeah, it was, in Denmark at least. We've only just gotten Wonder Woman 1984 for example, so I don't know what that's about. Anyways, onto my top 5 movie experiences released in 2020 in no particular order. I'm a huge Pixar fanboy. I don't think I'll ever be able to put into words my immense love for that studio and the various shorts and features they've made so far. So whenever they announce a new project, I'm always very, very excited. As a Dane, I'm used to waiting a long time on Pixar movies since they normally release about 6 months later here. But with Onward, I was extra excited. Because I think the idea of a modernized fantasy world is so fun and bright horrendously underdelivered on the same idea. So I, I was expecting a lot from the world. Tom Holland and Chris Pratt's chemistry was amazing in Infinity War, so hearing them in the trailers being all brotherly and stuff was wonderful. So I was ready to purchase my ticket for the showing early spring last year, when what we all know happened happened and everything closed. Disney Plus didn't arrive in Denmark before August, so suddenly I was thrown into this void of unknowingness. Release date news constantly being updated and postponed again and again, and then suddenly I got the notification that Onward was available for purchase. I bought it immediately and me and the missus watched it the very same evening. I know it is nowhere near the best Pixar movie, and some of you might even be thinking, really, you're including Onward instead of Soul? And yeah, I am, because I don't know if I was expecting too much of Soul, but the emotional core of Onward hit me harder. And even though I thought I had it figured out, it still pulled one over on me, like only Pixar movies seems to be able to. So even though it seems a bit like Chris Pratt is trying his darnest to impersonate Jack Black at times, and that the pacing is a bit chubby in certain areas of the film, I was thoroughly invested in Ian and Barley's quest from the very beginning. As you might noticed, Barley isn't wearing his usual getup. No, he's rocking Pete Davidson's khakis and body art. Fun fact about his tattoos, by the way, the portrait of Ruth Bader Ginsburg on his right shoulder had been removed from the posters of this movie, but not in the movie itself. If any of you know why, please comment, as I simply don't get it and would like to know. Is it some legal mumbo jumbo where she hadn't agreed to use her image to promote the movie? I guess it could be something like that. But yeah, Bali is taking on the responsibilities of Pete's character Scott in the drawing because the semi-biographical comedy The King of Staten Island, directed by Judd Apatow, was just wonderful. I don't normally think more of his flicks, they're fine comedies, but oftentimes nothing more than that and frankly, frequently a bit too long. And to be completely honest, I'm not entirely certain that this is any different. However, I am a huge fan of Pete Davidson and Bill Burr, and they both really do a great job in this. I was particularly impressed with Pete, since I hadn't seen him act before, if you disregard Saturday Night Live, which you should. Also, Belle Powley was an absolute joy to watch. She steals every scene she was in. But yeah, this film is so funny. I don't know how many times I've looked up various scenes here on YouTube to chuckle at them again and really chuckle, not just exhale strongly out the nose. The scene where Bill Burr goes to Pete's house for the first time springs to mind. It's so darn funny. And at its core, it's a very emotional film too. And if you're even a bit interested in Pete Davidson's life, it's a very cool glimpse into some of the feelings and trauma he must have dealt with. And this project must have been very therapeutic for him. Definitely worth a watch. The two adorable kids Pete's character walks to and from school is replaced in my drawing with two full-grown men. They are supposed to somewhat resemble Mass Mikkelsen and Nikolai Lee Kose's characters from the most recent movie by Anders Thomas Jensen. Okay, a brief history slash Danish cinema listen. 20 years ago, a guy called Anders Thomas Jensen made his debut feature film. It's called Flickering Lights. It's a dark comedy with a cast that ended up becoming some of the biggest heavy hitters in Danish filmmaking. I'm pretty sure I'm not exaggerating when I'm saying at least 90% of Danes would say it's the best Danish movie ever. He's sort of the Danish Tarantino, no formal training, just a genuine passion for movie making and the magic of it. Anyways, he followed Flickering Lights up with two absolute classics and, well, a miss. And then he disappeared, 
to have or raise his kids or something like that. Disappeared is maybe a bit harshly put. He stepped back from directing a bit and wrote a couple of things for other people instead. Gotta make a living, I suppose. But then it was announced that he was writing a new movie he was planning on directing himself and that he was getting the old gang back together and collaborating with all his regular star players, including Mads Mikkelsen. And no, it's not the Oscar-nominated Danish movie Another Round, also starring Mads Mikkelsen. That's spectacular too, though, so give it a watch. No, this movie is called Writers of Justice and is a very dark comedy about PTSD and the randomness of existence. And it is hilarious, grim, and so hard-hitting too. The characters in this film are wonderfully weird and traumatized in their own odd but believable ways. And the entire cast is incredible. Mess? Oh, and if you're thinking to yourself, why are you saying Matt's wrong? Then congratulations to you. You've just learned how to probably pronounce Mess. Just kinda ignore the D. Anyways, Mess is portraying a military general whose wife dies tragically whilst he's away and he has to return home and raise his teenage daughter. With his performance in this and his award-winning performance in another round, it was a running joke that Mads Mikkelsen was single-handedly saving the Danish cinema industry. And maybe he was. But shortly after these two films released, we went back into lockdown. But Writers of Justice was one of the first films I saw in the cinema last year in the brief window Denmark was opened back up again. And it was just so good being back in those slightly gross and uncomfortable seats, eating overpriced popcorn and watching a movie on the big screen with a bunch of strangers, laughing and shrieking together, pretending that the world was normal again, at least for the duration of the movie. And then the movie was a true return to form for Anna's Thomas Jensen, and probably even his best work since Flickering Lights. And I know you probably haven't seen Flickering Lights, so you can't fully comprehend the amount of praise I'm trying to convey that this movie is deserving of, and I know it might lose some of its humor in translation, but please do yourself a favor and give Writers of Justice a chance. I guarantee it's a fun and somewhat thought-provoking time to be had. The weird, somewhat star-shaped platform the characters are all placed upon is supposed to look like the poster for the musical Hamilton. I guess I could have dressed them up in old-timey clothes instead, but that would have been much harder to draw. Anyways, Hamilton is a musical about the founding of America that premiered on Broadway back in 2016, I think. The recording available on Disney Plus is absolutely spectacular. I'm not going to talk a lot about this. If you're interested in musicals, you've definitely already watched this because it was an absolute phenomenon, and rightfully so. You might have noticed a big demon bear in the background of the piece, and that is probably the inclusion that is the most spoilery. So please accept my deepest apologies. Anyways, I love superhero movies. You know, like with an irrational passion. So last year started out with Bloodshot and Birds of Prey hitting the cinemas as scheduled, but then everything went down the toilet. I was so excited for all the big superhero releases scheduled for 2020, especially Marvel's The Eternals, which still doesn't have a trailer out. What's up with that, by the way? Anyways, I was also super excited for the last Fox-produced X-Men-related movie ever to see the light of day, The New Mutants. Now I know that this entire franchise has been a mixed bag. Some have been really, really good, and some have been neon watchables. Uh, a lot of them simply just is. Not terrible, not terrific, but somewhere in that undesirable, forgettable, but kinda enjoyable space. And to be completely honest, it's in the latter that the New Mutants ended up. Sadly too, since it was Fox's last try. But it's amazing that we even got to see this dumb movie. The production story of this film is a crazy tale and might even make for a better movie. Because after multiple delays, planned reshoots that never happened and Disney then finally just outright purchasing most of Fox, I was sure that we'd never get to see it. But luckily I was wrong. And I wholeheartedly believe that this movie was terribly wounded by the various delays from way before delaying movie news had become the norm. Of course, releasing a movie amidst a pandemic is hurting it, but what I'm referring to is that since they ended up not adding new reshoots to the cut that was completed back in 2016, I think, they would have got all that goodwill of Game of Thrones and Stranger Things because of the geniuses who casted this movie. And the cast is really good. Diverse and strong young actors and actresses doing a lot of good work in this weirdly paced coming of age is story. This movie premiered whilst Denmark was opened ever so slightly back up in September. So prior to this release, I hadn't seen Superheroes Wreck Shop since Harley Quinn broke into that police station back in February. And that might not sound that bad, but you have to remember, I expected almost a superhero feature every month in the beginning of the year. 
so I was really overdue for superhero shenanigans on the silver screen, and therefore this dumb movie is included in this piece because it came in the exact time I truly needed it. And I unironically love it. I adore coming of age stories in which teenagers have to figure out existence, it delivered on that. I love weird superpowers that are hard to translate from the comics to live action, it delivered on that. And I enjoyed the genre bending nature of it, a little rom-com-ish, then a little horror-ish, and throughout it all, silly superpowers. A perfect ending to the weird franchise that Fox's X-Men movies ended up being. So those were my best movie experiences from last year. Please let me know if you had similar experiences with any of these five films, or if I missed out on a great release or something like that. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. But yeah, that's it for now. If you liked the drawing, consider liking the video. And if you liked the video, consider subscribing. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one.